Hi everyone, welcome to the first in a series of videos where I feature the sparring decks that uh, I was talking about in the previous video. This was inspired by Tris, an initiative for newer players to play fixed decks that um, encourage good fundamentals and exhibit the theme of their respective factions in Netrunner. Today we'll be looking at the Jinteki vs Kuruno matchup. As a refresher, these are the decks that we'll be featuring. If you are, uh, want to know more about these decks, be sure to check out um, the, the video that I made last time where I go through each of these decks in relatively more detail. Um, however, here we'll just be featuring the playthrough, but we'll also talk about some matchup specific strategies that both sides can employ in order to improve their win rate. We'll start with the Jinteki side, which I will be playing today. Um, up against Leela Patel, uh, you will notice that your largest, your biggest strength by far is your ability to gear check the runner. As we mentioned last time, gear checking is when uh, you basically tell the runner you need to have your breakers out, otherwise you can't get through the remote. In Jinteki's case, it is particularly punishing uh, for Leela to run without their full set of breakers, their barrier, code gate, and sentry breakers, because uh, if they're missing even one of those components and hit the ice that they cannot break, uh, you can severely punish them by trashing their programs, which they cannot recur from their heap, or you will deal some net damage to them, which they cannot prevent. Uh, and this could potentially wear them out or potentially even set them up for a flat line. So this is something you need to leverage on as the corp. You need to leverage on the runner's fear of running, their passiveness in the early game, to get an advantage going early, that is to say, scoring early agendas. Keeping in mind that Leela can still contest your remotes with and a run event called Inside Job, meaning that you want to have at least two eyes on your remotes to successfully deter any uh, threats from your opponent. Uh, one of the best tools in your arsenal um, against Leela in the mid to late game is your House of Knives agenda. Um, even if the runner has all their breakers set up, they still have to play around this agenda, which allows you to deal net damage at any time should they choose to run. So um, this is somehow you hopefully build up to match point, uh, meaning to say when you're on four or five agenda points, that's called match point because you only need to score potentially one more agenda to win. Uh, once you get to that point, the runner has to play a lot more aggressively in order to stop you from winning and that's where they'll trip and fall. So the runner on the other hand has... Um, Looks like they're not very favoured, uh, given what we said. They don't have any net damage pre prevention cards in their deck, so they will slowly but surely run out of cards um, if they take too much damage. As such, it is very important for Leela to conserve their cards in this particular matchup. For example, Exclusive Party is a card that pays out more as you have more of them in your heap. That is to say, early game, they're not that good, but late game, when you draw your last few copies of Exclusive Party, they can potentially reward you with a lot of money. Because they are so inefficient in the early game, I would suggest that early Exclusive Parties should be kept in your hand instead of being discarded or played. That way, they can be serve as net, net damage fodder, uh, which is fairly important. Not to mention that when you your exclusive parties get hit by net damage, they still go to the bin, meaning that they'll still power up your exclusive parties that you draw later on. Another important thing, very, very vital to note as the Leela player, is that your breakers are very important. Again, you have no way to recur programs that have been trashed. Uh, yeah. That, that is to say programs in the bin. So in particular, you only have one fractor, one barrier breaker in the Saker. So once you draw your Saker, or once you find it in your deck, you need to play it on the board ASAP. You do not want it to get sniped from net damage, and believe me, net damage can come anywhere, anytime. With Jintagi Personal Evolution's ability, all they need to do is score an agenda, and there's a chance that the Saker in your hand can get sniped into the bin. Once that happens, it's going to be very difficult for you to claw back into the game, because you can no longer break barriers. Now, once you have your breakers set up, you still have to worry about net damage, however, your deck has a surprising number of ways with which to circumvent this, giving you a rather favourable time should you get uh, into the mid to late game. Employee Strike is uh, an event in your deck. It is a current that allows you to disable your opponent's identity ability. This allows you to uh, sidestep the net damage that you otherwise incur from stealing agendas. 
Political Operative is one of your few resources, but it's a very vital one in this matchup because it allows you to kill the net damage upgrades in Ben Musashi and Hokusai Grid before they can inflict the net damage on you. Uh, as you want to take as few net damage as possible, Political Operative is a very crucial card to get down and is a good way of punishing your opponent should they choose to leave HQ unguarded. Um, so yes, um, that's about it. Um, now we'll head into the game. I'll be playing against Triss, who will be playing the Leela side, and we'll see how the game goes. Alright, we'll be doing some newbie friendly commentary here. This means that I'll be playing the video at a slower play pace, and I will show cards on the top right corner of the screen when I refer to them as far as possible. The first thing you will notice here is that most people will try to play Celebrity Gift turn 1 to get maximum effect and gain lots of money. You see here that I instead chose to play the standard Ice Ice Hedge Fund opening and on my second turn, draw up so that I can set myself up to show 5 cards with the Celebrity Gift on the third turn. I do so because I do not want to reveal information about my central ice to my opponent. So my opponent now plays a fairy. But they still have to worry that I might have some nasty cold gates or barriers on my centrals. Now it's turn number 3 and as I promised, I was about to play the Celebrity Gift here. But then I thought and I realized that this was a prime opportunity to score this agenda here. It's a Philotic Entanglement and I can score it even though it's in my hand because I use Shipment from Tenin, which allows me to fast advance a 3, advance, three advanceable agenda from my hand. This puts me in the lead with 2 points to none. And the reason I did this was so that um, I could get on the board early. As mentioned in the opening of the video, I want to put the pressure on the runner by getting to match point as early as possible. Just a friendly reminder, match point is when you get up to 4 or 5 agenda points, thereby threatening a win by scoring just one more agenda. So then I follow up with the Celebrity Gift on turn 4. Finally, I finally find the time to get my Celebrity Gift money and then I place an ice on HQ. Even though I showed my opponent my hand, they can't really guess what my HQ ice is because I showed them three different eyes, a Cortex Lock, an Aiki, and a Galahad. I'm not going to show all of them, but basically they're all three different types. Barrier, Sentry, Code Gate. So again, this basically forces my opponent to get their entire Breaker Suite out, which they actually have. They have a Fairy, Abagnale, and Saker. Again, I'm not going to show them, but you can trust me, these are their Sentry Breaker, Code Gate Breaker, and Barrier Breaker respectively. So here, I'm going to start setting up my remote so I can score my next agenda when I draw it, but my opponent plays aggressively an inside job onto R&D. This card allows you to bypass the outermost piece of ice. Therefore, there is no point in me resing the R&D ice because they will bypass it anyway. Better to keep it unres so that they still don't know what it is. They will be forced to react to it the next time they run R&D properly. Now at this juncture, I'd like to bring up a subtle move that I made earlier on a preemptive move against this particular runner, against Leela Patel, who tends to be very aggressive. You can um, pretty re uh, much expect them to run Sneak Door Beta. This is a card that allows them to gain leverage uh, on an open archives, undefended archives, by converting it into a successful HQ run. This is why you notice that I actually place an ice on archives preemptively, even before my opponent played the sneak door. Oftentimes, if you wait for the sneak door to be installed before def thinking of defending archives, it is usually too little too late your opponent will have already reaped the benefits of successful HQ runs by then. Not to mention that there are other reasons why protecting archives preemptively is good. Um, your opponent might have cards that require successful runs on empty servers such as Dirty Laundry. It also offers you more options as you move on with the game. If later on, for some reason, you need to pitch an agenda into archives, it will be much less likely that the runner will run archives to check it if you already have an existing ice on archives. Now in this upcoming turn, I will mandatorily draw my violet level clearance. Watch how I play around this card, which can be very tricky to play. It draws you a lot of cards, 4 cards, and it ends your turn immediately, sending you to the discard phase. Typically this means you'll be forced to discard a lot of the cards you've just drawn, which is bad because you want to use these cards, you don't want to put them in the bin, for the most part. As such, on the first Two clicks, I attempt to install as many of my ice as possible, so my remote gets an additional ice and my R&D gets an additional ice as well. 
Having more ice is always good against Leela Patel, who can easily bounce your ice bank to your hand when the Genesis are scored or stolen. This puts me on 6 cards after playing the Violet level clearance, which means that I'm forced to discard 1 card at the end of my turn. Um, pretty obvious that it would be the Breach Dome, because that makes my archives that much more spiky. Don't forget, Breach Dome activates on access regardless of which server it is currently in. This includes archives. Going back to the game, my opponent runs my HQ and accesses an Obo Carter protocol. This inflicts 4 net damage on them, plus the 1 net damage from my ID ability. This is usually enough to flatline a runner, but my opponent did two very smart things. Firstly, they ran HQ with a grip full of cards. If they access the Obokata protocol with four or fewer cards in hand, they could not steal it without flatlining. So a very smart move to pad your hand out with as many cards as possible before starting the run. Secondly, my opponent ran on their first click. This allowed them to then draw back up um, to, uh, using their remaining clicks and end their turn with 4 cards in hand, putting them well out of range of any sort of net damage kill that I might be packing. Of course, this comes at a cost. Because they spent their clicks drawing up instead of running my remote, I was able to score a brain trust. However, my opponent then counter-attacks me, like a counter-punch, with a maker's eye on R&D. This allows them to access a bunch of cards from my R&D, which then snags them a bunch of agendas in return. Two agendas, in fact, putting the score at 4-6 to six in favour of my opponent. That was a huge opening that I conceded to my opponent. You might be wondering, wait a minute, didn't you have three eyes on R&D? Well, yes, I did. They are now back in my hand because Leela's ability triggered so many times. Once when they stole my Obo Carter, once when I stole the Brain Trust, and when they stole two more agendas of the makers I run on R&D, they demolished my remote. You saw that my remote was reduced to one ice at the end of their maker's eye turn. That was devastating. That was terrible for me. I was forced to spend a lot of money and clicks to rebuild uh, my defenses. And I do need those defenses because one more agenda is all it takes for my opponent to win the game. That is never a position where you want to be in. Um, it's good when you're on match point, but it's bad when your opponent's on match point. So it's a very tenuous situation. You will also notice that this is further compounded by the fact that I'm also on match point. Even though I'm only on 4 points, I need 3 points to win, and they are right sitting there right in my hand right now. The second Obokata, which my opponent has not seen yet, that is live. If I can score it, I win the game. So I'm definitely looking at this Obokata as my way out for me uh, to pull a sneak victory from behind. But will it be sneaky? I might have to show it to my opponent with Celebrity Gift. So I'm thinking very hard about this turn here. My, my remote is pretty well fortified. There are two pieces of ice on it and two upgrades that deal net damage. I think this might be the chance for me to go for the Obokata score. But then I look at my ice again and I realize I do not have enough credits to rest them both and score the Obokata. This is something you have to calculate when you go, whenever you go for scoring an agenda. Um, you need to count the number of credits you need to score the agenda. Typically, that's equal to the number of advancement, uh, the advancement requirement. In this case, I need 5 advancements on the Obo Carter. That's going to cost me 5 credits. I have to add up the cost of the ice on my remote. I have to also add the cost of resing the upgrades. Um, this deck runs 2 upgrades, Ben Musashi and Hokusai Grid. Both of them cost money to res. And if that isn't enough, you still need to consider the cost of resing central ice. That's right, look at R&D right now, it's very weak. There's only one res ice protecting it and it's not a very strong piece of ice as well. I need to be able to res that at a moment's notice. So what I did on that turn was to play the celebrity gift, showing the winning agenda in the Obo Carter protocol, and then installing it in the remote. Now my opponent doesn't know for sure that's an Obo Carter protocol, because I also showed a breach dome in my hand. So a bit of mind games there. Mind games are always what you want as Jinteki. And on this turn, I decide to go for the score. It's now or never, I tell myself. So I put a third piece of ice on the remote to make it even more secure. Don't forget, 
Uh, Criminals run inside job. It's a very powerful card that renders one of my eyes useless. So I need to have more eyes to soak up that inside job. Um, so install and double advance the overcut and the remote is my play. I'm saying if you run this, you might win, but can you take all that net damage? So on my on this seemingly, this final turn is either my opponent fetches an agenda to win or I score this for the win. My opponent draws a bunch of cards and then plays the inside job on their last click. So this is what I prepared for. This is why I place that cheap ice outside of R&D. My opponent bypasses it with inside job and then I make them hit the Kakugo. I did not rest my middle ice because I knew that my opponent had more than enough credits to break it. So the only relevant aspect here was the amount of net damage I could inflict on them during the run. My opponent took one net damage from the Kakugo, then I res all my upgrades. The Hokusai grid inflicts one net damage. Upon the successful run, they will lose one card from the six card hand, and now they only have five cards. This is not enough to steal the Oboe Carter protocol. Normally, you must take 4 net damage to steal an Oboe Carter protocol, but because I've arrested Ben Musashi in the same server, my opponent has to pay an additional 2 net damage. 6 net damage is too much for my opponent, they can only access the Oboe Carter and choose not to steal it. Jinteki's 1000 cuts proved too much for my opponent to handle, and when they passed that turn over to me, I was able to triple advance the Oboe Carter, putting me at exactly 7 agenda points to score out for the win. Wasn't that a crazy way to end the game? That's what I play Netrunner for, to get these nail-biting finishes. And oftentimes, after games, I look back whether I won and lost and ask myself, what could have been done differently to have changed the outcome? Well, doing some analysis on that final run, that final turn, my opponent had to get through, whether they knew it or not, a Kakugo into um, ben Musashi, Hokusai Grid, and Obokata Protocol. You can see on your screen all these spiky little balls showing the amount of net damage my opponent must take in order to successfully get to the final Obokata. Unfortunately, they only ran with 7 cards in hand, and if you do some quick arithmetic, you'll see that they need to take 8 net damage. They're just one short, but they could have done something different. Some of you more experienced players probably have already seen this. My opponent broke the Kakugo with their Barrier Breaker, the Seiker. But that has a special ability on it, one that most people can easily overlook. Um, you can use the final ability to return Seiker to your grip to de -res a barrier. In this particular situation, if my opponent used this ability after breaking the Kakugo, it would have done two things that would have completely altered the outcome of the game. Firstly, they would have gained one extra card in hand, the Seiko would have gone back to hand, meaning that they would have eight cards left in hand, and that would allow them to actually steal the Obokata. Not only that, it also de the Kukugo. Now, Kukugo deals net damage when the runner passes it, which is to say, when they get after they break the subroutines and then move on to the next piece of ice or to the inside of the server. Uh, but when my opponent moves past the ice, they go, they check the Kakugo, but there is no Kakugo to be had because it's already de -res. Therefore, Kakugo's net damage ability does not actually fire because it is inactive when the runner meets the passing of the ice trigger condition. As such, my opponent need only take 7 net damage, so they would actually be able to steal the Obokata with one card remaining in hand. Either way, they would have won the game instead of not being able to steal the Oboe Carter. So small plays like this can make a huge difference. Well, I hope you enjoyed uh, um, this video. This is going to be the first in a series, I hope. Um, I hope to get more interesting games such as this going with the other decks in um, the seven decks that I constructed. And as you can see, um, even though these are basic decks in the sense that I tried to make them accessible to new players, make no mistake, these decks provide dynamic, nail-biting games and they reward skilled play and there are so many nuances to the decks that uh, you can have a lot of fun with them um, well past the first playthrough. So if you enjoyed this video, I hope you can do one or more of these things. Most importantly, share these decks with um, other new players who might be interested in the game. Um, this is a very good way to use your 
um, old core sets and your old data packs to um, yeah, construct decks while, while we wait for the new cycle to come out and hopefully decks that will get players more interested in the game. Um, if you are a new player watching this video, I would highly appreciate any comments and suggestions about how I presented this video because I typically um, gear my videos towards an audience which knows the entire card pool and are probably more familiar with the ins and outs of the game. Do you think my commentary was too fast, too confusing for you? And were the visual cards on top right of the screen during the game helpful um, in, uh, in familiarizing yourself with the card pool on both the decks? Please let me know. Um, I would. This information is valuable as it will help me make uh, better videos in the future. As always, um, thanks for watching and happy net running. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.